Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. <clears throat> my name is Rajat, and along with Maggie Chung, I serve as a co-chair for the RFS Communications Committee. On the behalf of the Society of Interventional Radiology Resident Fellow and Student Section, thank you for taking your time out of uh, tonight to be here for this informative webinar on Y90 therapy. Uh, before we hand it over to our presenter for tonight, I want to remind everyone that this webinar will be recorded and will be available on YouTube in the coming days by searching IR Education. Anyone is free to ask questions at any time throughout the webinar simply by entering them into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll keep track of them and either answer them during the webinar or at the end. Also, please check the RFS website regularly for upcoming events and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for other updates and posting of clinical IR educational material. So without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Jeff Farrell. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having us. Th thank you for having me, and uh, thanks for um, coming and spending your night here with me. Um, so. I am the Interventional Oncology Service Line Chair, and one of the uh, goals of our service line was to start a um, webinar series specifically geared towards medical student members. So I don't know how many medical student members we have uh, right now um, present, but uh, this, is, this webinar is more geared to medical student level compared to resident or fellow level. Um, this topic is on um, Y90 therapies, therapy specifically for primary hepatocellular carcinoma and liver metastasis. Um, I'm also a uh, R4 resident at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and then we'll be headed to Ohio State uh, next year for Interventional Radiology Fellowship. Um, so let's just begin here. Um, so first I have no financial disclosures. I just want to make sure everybody can hear me, correct? Okay. Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, so uh, just a brief outline of the webinar here. So first we're going to just discuss what exactly is Uridium-90, uh, indications, patient selection, complications, uh, review of vascular anatomy and variants, uh, MMA mapping, uh, one, the Y90 procedure itself, inspect CT imaging, that's role in the Y90 procedure, patient follow-up and results. So <clears throat> this four, the first schematic on the left just basically shows the, the decay uh, of uridium-90. Um, it's a pure beta emitter that decays to uh, zirconium-90. Uh, we take advantage of, of uh, uridium-90 because it, because it's a beta emitter, it emits a large amount of energy, and, but only um, a short distance, with a mean penetration of 2.5 millimeters and a maximum distance of 11 millimeters. So that specific energy is 2.2 uh, mega electron volts. And so this take advantage of this because we inject this intra-arterially into the um, basically the liver where the either metastatic colorectal cancer is or the primary hepatocellular carcinoma is. So um, it causes local radiation, uh, necrosis to the tumor itself without having the systemic side effect of other forms of chemotherapy as an alternative or uh, radiation therapy um, as, as we know it uh, predominantly by what the radiation oncology. Provide. Now, on the market today, there's two commercially available um, products that contain uridium-90, Therospheres, and the other is Therospheres, and I'll discuss the differences of those in subsequent slides. So this image uh, on, the, on the right here is uh, the Thertex company, um, and this is what the Y90 looks like when you, you get it. So there's a saline solution with the different uh, uh, microspheres on there. Um, and this is how it's stored and, and carried and then ultimately placed in a plastic cube. And this cube is a little bit intimidating at first when you are working with it. Um, it's kind of like a Rubik's cube in a way. Um, and they place that the vial 
that I showed on the previous slide into, into this container and through a series of different um, holes in the device, they can safely extract the uranium-90 out into the patient without contaminating the area. And one of the other things you might be asking is, why is it stored in a plastic tube versus a sort of lead shielding? And that's because the beta uh, particles that are sent out, if they interact with a heavy um, substance like lead, can actually lead to more scatter radiation than the plastic. It's a commonly... Um, so let's move on to just the differences between the surspheres and therospheres. Um, surspheres is uh, from a company called Surtex in Australia. And they use a microsphere particle that's bound to uh, where they bind the uridium-90 to a resin uh, microsphere versus the therospheres. Microspheres are um, glass based and they um, they have the actual uridium-90 uh, bound within the actual matrix of the glass itself. Now, the sizes of the microspheres differ. The uh, surspheres have a slightly larger range, extending from 20 to 60 microns, versus the therospheres, which range from 20 to 30 microns. In addition, the amount of uh, ghosts that the radioactivity basically that each microsphere has is around 50 baccarels for the surface versus 2,500 baccarels for the therosphere. Because of the higher dose of the per uh, microsphere for the therospheres, you don't have to have as many actual microsphere particles uh, compared to the surspheres. So. As I'll mention during the procedure, one of the things that you worry about when you're administering the Y90 microspheres is that you worry about reflux and non-target embolization. So there's theoretically a decreased risk of non of um, reflux with the theres theres compared to the surspheres because they have a smaller number of total uh, microspheres that are injected. Um, in addition, <clears throat> when they were getting FDA approval, for the different um, treatments. Therospheres was originally FDA approved in 1999 under their humanitarian device exemption to treat primary cellular carcinoma and specifically for unresectable age with or without portal vein thrombosis or bridge liver transplantation. Now with the colorectal liver metastasis, Therospheres was FDA approved in 2002 for the, that treatment with the also common use of chemotherapy agent. Now I'll just kind of stop here for just a second and um, discuss alternative um, treatment options for primary APC that we're not going to discuss here, but <clears throat> are, are you know obviously surgical resection, transplantation, uh, <clears throat> chemotherapy. And also um, ablation, ablation procedures. I'm just getting some static back from one of you. Um, so these are other options. So I think these are the the primary hepatocellular carcinoma and. Uh, Rectal liver metastases um, are usually uh, patients with those are usually brought up at a tumor board and they discuss the overall history of the patient and how well to um, or what is the best approach to treat those patients. So I'm kind of very sub selecting patients on this presentation to, and for treatment. So, another um, aspect of my 90 therapy that I want to talk about is uh, technetium micro uh, human albumin aggregated particles. So this is uh, something that's used for actually the mapping, uh, not necessarily for the treatment. Technetium um, has a photo energy of 140 keV and is a gamma emitter. 
and it has a half life of six hours. It's actually, if you ever heard of the BQ it's the same radio chosen that we use for the BQ fans. Now, this later. The general indications for viral therapy uh, include unrecyclable hepatocellular carcinoma, primary or metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, ideally, you would want to have liver dominant tumor burden without um, sensitive uh, extra hepatic disease. You should also have a life expectancy of about three months. Some contraindications, um, and this has to do sort of with the mapping that I uh, mentioned, alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, so what we worry about when we're injecting the Y90 therapy is shunting um, that can go elsewhere, either non-target embolization or shunting to the lungs. So if they're in the mapping process has a potential for greater than 30 gray radiation to the exposure to the lung, or there's a significant flow to the GI tract that cannot be corrected by embolization with coils, such as the GDA. Uh, we technically typically avoid doing Y90 in these patients. Um, if there's excessive tumor burden throughout the liver and there's limited hepatic reserve, uh, we avoid Y90 because we can send these patients into uh, worsening liver failure. And if there's an elevated total bilirubin greater than two in the absence of a reversible cause, um, we typically try to avoid um, doing Y90 in those patients as well. Uh, other factors when you're concerning pa um, considering patient selection for Y90 therapy, uh, you want to see if the patient lacks ascites, which is a, a good prognostic sign. You want to have nor normal synthetic liver function. Typically, that's assessed by making sure that the patient's albumin is greater than three. Like I mentioned before, the total ability ribbon should be below two. And in terms of the patient's overall performance status, um, there's something called the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Performance Status, or ACOG for short. And typically, patients that are zero to two um, basically uh, have the best outcomes. So. I have a little chart just, just quickly describing that. Basically, zero is a normal activity. One is uh, you have some symptoms, um, but you're still it can be ambulatory, but you're restricted with strenuous activity. Two, you're kind of in bed 50% of the time, but you're still able for um, sort of self-care to a certain limit. Um, patients basically three or above usually um, are, do not do as well. So getting to some complications of uridium-90 therapy include hepatic dysfunction that occurs from radiation-induced liver disease that typically is, is more rare and only occurs about 0 to 4%. Um, you can worsen liver function and cirrhosis by causing hepatic, uh, fibro leading to fibro hepatic fibrosis and portal hypertension. Another very common um, Symptom is post embolization symptom, which is kind of like flu like symptoms where you get fever, chills that typically last for approximately three days but then get better over time. If those symptoms don't get better over time after sort of three days and persistently worsen, then you have to start thinking about infection. Um, and the next is uh, radiation induced cholecystitis, and that's actually from non target embolization of the cystic artery that that will lead to the radiation-induced cholecystitis. <clears throat> so you want to try to prevent as, as much reflux as possible into the cystic artery. And that's typically treated with antibiotics with or without cholecystectomy, depending on the severity. Uh, you can lead to an, uh, getting abscess formation, myelomas. Those are treated typically with drainage. Radiation pneumonitis, that's uh, caused by <clears throat> non-target embolization from shunting leading to uh, the Y90 particles going into the lungs causing a pneumonitis. You can get gastroenteritis slash gastric ulcers from non-target embolization of the GDA or left gastric. Some interventional radiologists actually prophylactically embolize with coils the GDA, GDA um, prior to, uh, during the mapping procedure prior to the Y90 therapy specifically to prevent these ulcers. Also, um, after the procedure, patients are typically sent home with a, a proton pump inhibitors that help prevent gastric ulcers. 
and of sort of a, a rare uh, cause, um, but can potentially happen if the falciform artery is is present, is um, you can cause radiation dermatitis from a non-target embolization of the falciform artery. So just getting to uh, review some vascular anatomy. Knowing your anatomy uh, is very important um, during the mapping procedure because you need to identify which arterial vessels supply the tumor slash tumors of interest. Um, one of the important um, terminology that you should all be aware of is the terms, you know, replace versus accessory. So if there's a, let's say, a replaced right hepatic artery from the SMA, that means that the a native right hepatic artery is not present versus if there's an accessory off the SMA, then you're going to still have the native right um, hepatic artery as well as an additional artery supplying the um, tumor uh, into the um, in the right lobe of the liver. So when you're doing your mapping, you need to identify all the vessels that could be ten potentially supplying the tumors because they ultimately have to be embolized. And you can actually, during the mapping procedure, when you are administering the uh, technetium MAA, you can split that dose. Or And then when you're at the Y90 um, administration, you should al could also split that dose up between the arteries that are supplying to ensure that the arterial supply to that tumor is embolized and radiation um, <clears throat> energy from the uh, beta particles can be appropriately administered to the, the tumor for to result in tumor necrosis. <clears throat> if there is um, lesions near the dome of the liver, one um, important thing to remember is that phrenic arteries are known to supply those tumors, so you should also take a look at the phrenic arteries as well during your mapping procedure. And so this image on the right is just showing a celiac angiogram that <clears throat> demonstrates the hepatic arteries, the typical GEA, left gastric, splenic artery. So that's that was the normal anatomy. This is sort of the variant anatomy illustration. So this is a replaced hepatic, right hepatic artery from the SMA, very commonly seen. And also if you're gonna have the most um, common replace left hepatic artery is coming off the left gastric, as you can see here. Let's see if we have any questions thus far. No questions. So in terms of pre-procedural workup for patients, you want to make sure to have a detailed history and physical. You want to have a baseline CBC, liver function test, albumin, LDH, INR, CA if it's metastatic col um, colorectal cancer, and alpha feed of protein if it's HCC. Um, in terms of imaging, you want to have further imaging to look for extra hepatic disease, specifically a chest CT for metastatic disease. And you can get an MRI slash CT of the abdomen and pelvis to look for extra hepatic disease, also um, to assess for portal vein patency. Now, Y90, um, um, the uh, the uh, Therospheres and um, serospheres, you can treat with uh, portal vein if the portal vein is um, has thrombus. That's not necessarily a contraindication. Um, you want to make follow through with the angiograms um, and the MMA mapping to look for variant anatomy and any shunts, and also consider most commonly this procedure can be done on conscious sedation but you also want to assess um, for like the malpotty score to see if the patient can have conscious sedation versus needs sort of assistance with anesthesiology. Um, so this <clears throat> slide just sort of de details what I've already kind of said before when you're doing the mapping procedure. So you're gonna do angiograms, basically the aorta, the SMA, the celiac, to have better <clears throat> visualization of a, a variant anatomy. Possibly you want to consider embolizing the GDA or left gastric if you think that the, there's going to be significant flow that could cause ulcer formation. Uh, consider the evaluation of the phrenic arteries if there's lesions near the dome. For <clears throat> This is a very basic slide, but I didn't know um, how many of you are very familiar with different catheters and their, their roles. Um, so the image on the left um, so shows a series of catheters. Some are flush catheters. 
the, the di versus selective catheters. The main difference is flush catheter has a multiple side holes, as you can see in this pigtail flush catheter and this sauce flush catheter. And so if you're going to be doing these angiograms or you're going to be doing runs, you want to use a flush catheter so that the contrast that you're administering is evenly distributed out safely um, versus a selective catheter, which is, has an end hole catheter that if you power inject through that, you can lead to uh, arterial dissection. But these catheters are, are useful for selecting different arteries when you're passing guide wires, which are these next two images. This is a Benson guide wire. It's a little bit stiffer and but non-traumatic. Um, and can be used for different exchanges and stability. Uh, this one is called a glide wire, which is a hydrophilic wire that needs to be coated with basically saline at all times. If it's not coated with saline, it becomes very uh, sticky and, and, and doesn't um, navigate well. Um, but when it is... Uh, coated with saline, it's, it's hydrophilic and can very... Uh, be used to navigate through very tight uh, areas and, and torturous turns. And so when you're getting more distally into the hepatic arteries, um, this is very useful um, to get more distal. And then <clears throat> ultimately you would, through this, one of these selective catheters or your base catheter, which I don't have an image, you can place a microcatheter, which is a smaller, usually these um, or 035, 038 um, catheters, but you can get uh, smaller, like 018s, which are the micro catheters. Uh, the, they're, sorry, the, well, I'm sorry, these are different um, print sizes, but allows for the different wires of those sizes to go through. <clears throat> um, so moving on to so the mapping portion of the procedure. So this, I just want to mention that we give like a four to five millicurry dose of MMA that's injected and uh, hopefully um, if all goes well it just goes to the tumor but if there's any sh shunt um, present they can go elsewhere in the body and so we evaluate that with spec CT imaging which I have some images of different cases that we'll go through towards the end. Um, I'm going to mention that and so basically um, just as the mapping procedure um, that you do uh, once you know which vessels supply the tumor of interest you'll bring the patient back um, again another day for the Y90 administration and then you will uh, basically navigate your way back up with different catheters and guide wires uh, to that area and ultimately administer the um, the Y90 whether it be serospheres or um, therospheres so just, <clears throat> I sort of went back and forth through different aspects of the procedure. So this is just sort of a standard outline of, of what to do um, when you're doing the procedure. So you always um, typically access from the right groin. So you want to make sure to prep and drape that area. Make sure that, you know, at least moderate constant sedation is on board. You, you obtain access to the, the artery. Once you uh, get in, you'll get into the abdominal aorta, perform an aortogram allows better visualization of the celiac, renals, and SMAs. Then you can perform a superior, basically, SMA angiogram to evaluate the any accessory or replace hepatic arteries. For, this is still for the mapping um, portion of the procedure. And then you perform a celiac followed by, you know, common hepatic. Once again, just looking for the anatomy and for the vessels supplying the tumors. And then once you, you identify the vessels, then you'll inject the MMA. You follow up with um, the spec CT, and then if you bring the patient back, you already know where you need to go um, for the Y90 portion of the procedure, so you'll gain access again, and then you'll set up either the sursers or thyrosers, and then generally inject them slowly to prevent uh, reflux until hemostasis is achieved or the dose is fully administered, and then you'll uh, perform another selective post-embolization arteriogram just to confirm that everything has been um, completely flushed out of the catheter as well as hemostasis achieved and then, then remove everything and then make sure hemostasis is achieved at the right the right groin. All right, so let's I just have two cases kind of um, that we, we did at my institution. Um, this is an 
MRI, T1, uh, post-GAD, arterial phase image <clears throat> of the liver, sort of segment 8 near the dome. Um, for those that may not be familiar with uh, body MR, um, HCC is one of the few things that we can pretty much diagnose by imaging alone and does not need a biopsy. And some of those um, factors in this case is um, that you can diagnose HCC is early arterial enhancement, which is this uh, on this image. And if we had a portal venous phase, you would see washout. Um, you would see a, you can see a capsule. It's more prone in patients who have cirrhosis. That's why they get surveillance for HCC. Um, so we kind of know based on your imaging where the tumor is located. So the image on the right, uh, we have a flush catheter in place, and we're doing a celiac angiogram. You're seeing, you're, this is just sort of the vessels, and on the next image, you're going to see a, a blush here in the right low where the the tumor is. So we have we identified the um, where the tumor is, which artery supplies it. This is more of a delayed view. So we, we navigate it up and we administer the MMA, MAA, sorry. And then this is a spec CT image where, show, where it's picking up the gamma radiation uh, from the technetium that's accumulated there. And we do not see any um, non-target uh, um, embolization from the particles that would um, suggest a shunt. So we came back <clears throat> and we knew where we needed to go within the right hepatic artery in this very distal selective branch. Um, we, we should inject some contrast, just make sure where we are, and then we'll inject the, the Y, I'm sorry, go back here. Um, we inject the Y90 and as you can see, the contrast that creates a blush, we do not see that after we injected, so there's been hemostasis that has occurred um, after the in injection. So uh, case two, sorry, we have a chat, okay. Um, in case two, sort of in segment four of the liver, we still see a rim enhancing uh, capsule, with, and this is more on the portal venous phase just to show that the, there is washout on there. Um, so I actually have a video for this one. It's not the it's a little bit jerky in quality, but as you're seeing the angiogram, you're seeing this blush here in the region of where the tumor was. This is the mapping portion. So once again, these are just uh, single shot images, angiograms of the hepatic arteries. This is the GA, this is the, the right hepatic. <clears throat> and, and so this is a, uh, or spec uh, CT just demonstrating the uptake with no shunting. So we proceeded with our Y90, ther we, Y90 ther therapy through the uh, microcatheter. This is still just uh, the contrast run to confirm where we are. It's still shot. And then this is a, a follow up video showing when we're kind of getting a, just about to achieve hemostasis after delivering the dose. This is just a, st a single shot. So those were two cases. Now just what do we typically do for patient follow-up? Um, patients are typically observed for two to six hours after the procedure, um, depending if our arterial puncture site is uh, used, a closure device was used or not. Um, so typically if we uh, use a closure device, we can uh, decrease patients' uh, stays to about two hours um, just because that's how long they're uh, leg needs to remain straight. Um, if we use manual compression, uh, typically it's four to six hours. Um, we do follow-up labs that sort of are repeated what we did from pre-procedural that are attained four to six weeks and we're just basically comparing their, their, their baseline, um, specifically looking for tumor markers that hopefully are going down for, for any uh, platelet dysfunction or uh, any bleeding with hemoglobin, liver total liver function and just a CMP. And then in terms of imaging, we typically order a triple phase CT or MRI at four to six weeks. And what we're looking for is we're looking for any abnormal enhancement that would behave similarly to either metastatic disease or hepatocellular carcinoma that 
would represent either recurrence or residual um, disease. And then we have um, typically have patients on proton pump inhibitors for 7 to 10 days, as I mentioned earlier, to prevent gastritis and gastric ulcers. So what are some of the results here? Um, so there's a lot of literature out there, and I could probably give a whole hour lecture on, on just different results. So I try to be pretty basic with this. So in terms of HCC treatment, I found that in certain studies demonstrate a response rate about 35 to 47 percent. Um, you know, Y90 is not a, a, a curative measure. Um, it's, it's, it's meant to basically prolong, prolong survival um, as a means to either um, decrease tumor burden or, or um, increase um, survival to transplantation. So in terms of median survival is, you know, 15 to 24 months. Um, it's safe in uh, patients with um, portal vein thrombosis. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of serafinib. Um, and so when used in conjunction with Y90, um, patients with metastatic HCC, um, it's tall rule number one, and it's also associated with longer overall survival and progression-free survival um, compared to previous studies with just serafinib alone. In terms of colorectal mets, um, the response rate is you know, approximately 35 to 43 percent, and the mean survival is between five and 14 months. And this is this is dependent, of course, on the, the original stage of disease and what chemotherapy that they were receiving, if they were responding or not responding. Basically, um, there's a Sir 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 is, uh, has a Surflox trial that pretty much just came out not too long ago that said in addition of CERT, which basically is another name for Y90 therapy, selective internal radiation therapy with full FOX based first line chemotherapy in patients with liver dominant or only uh, metastatic colorectal liver mets show no significant difference in progression free survival, but significantly delayed d disease progression in the liver. Um, so those are some of the results. So I know that's a lot and I probably uh, went a little bit quicker than I anticipated going, but uh, at this time, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Let's see here. We got, I think we have one. So my the first question by Ali, um, he said, uh, great over, uh, do, do you give any antibiotics or PCA pump post-op? Um, Typically, our, our Y90 patients that that we uh, do actually go home the same day. We don't necessarily treat them with a you know a PCA pump. Um, uh, we may give them some pain meds depending on how they're feeling, um, just like oxycodone, five milligrams. We try to avoid the um, Tylenol just because of the you know the liver issues, liver toxicity. In terms of antibiotics, we don't we don't give uh, antibiotics. Um, but one thing that we typically do do is uh, give um, the proton pump inhibitors for sure. A lot has to do with the attending preference. Um, none of our attendings, to my knowledge, will routinely prophylactically embolize the GDA. Um, but at other institutions, they do. So. Um, I think they're just a little bit more cautious when they're administering the microspheres um, to prevent reflux into the, the GDA or left gastric. So, what would you embolize uh, the GDA with? So you just use coils, any 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 type of coils. You don't want to uh, use like particles or anything because it can lead to necrosis. So we typically the standard treatment is just coils, and you and you do that during the mapping procedure. And one of the reasons you you do that is you want to, and then you would coil um, the GDA, and then you would administer your technetium MAA because you, that would give you the best um, estimate of any if there's going to be any reflux into the GI tract when you do the spec CT afterwards. Um, so next question, sorry for whatever reason this is, 
what is the indication that determines the use of Y90 over embolization or chemoembolization? So that's a that's a, a good question. A lot goes into that, um, and usually these questions are discussed at length over like a tumor board. Um, some things with uh, well, number one, um, taste is cheaper than um, Y90 for sure. Um, the uh, the other is, I believe, to my knowledge, that if there's portal vein thrombosis, um, you do not want to necessarily treat with taste. Um, but um, you know, taste, um, and there's not necessarily been tremendous. Uh, literature out there that says one is better than the other and in some case some institutions even they talk about bland embolization they just do bland embolization they don't even do taste or y90 so it's really you know a tough uh, thing to discuss and, and choose um, I know where we rotate at the VA they were just they were just doing taste and they didn't have a y90 um, sometimes uh, facilities, um, it's very hard to start a Y90 program because, as you can imagine, you're you're dealing with uh, you know Y90 and you need to become an an authorized user, which is an involved plan. You have to have a pretty well organized nuclear medicine department as well, and so a lot of those factors play in, and I think it just becomes uh, more of an attending um, preference. So, sorry, I don't have really a great answer for that one. Um, any difference in response rate in primary HCC between SIR and Therospheres? Um, so I don't really have a definitive answer between the two. Um, Therospheres was a, that was the one that was originally approved for HCC. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a great answer for that one either. It's just that I think that typically, you know, um, if you're treating HCC, people typically would use Therospheres because that was originally what the FDA it was a uh, thing approving it for uh, versus the Therospheres. Um, next question. So, what is the greatest? pre-procedural predictive factor for a good response to Y90. So I don't think there's necessarily one um, predictive factor. I think the main ones that I mentioned, you want to have a bilirubin less than two, which says, and, uh, says that you have good overall liver function. You want to have good hepatic reserve, for sure. Um, your ECOG status um, should be between, you know, lower the possible, zero being the best. Um, those important factors, I, I think, are, are the best. Um, if you have lower tumor burden as well, but if you have, low, let's say you had a two millimeter, I mean, I'm sorry, two centimeter single HCC lesion, you know, Y90 is probably uh, not the best case for that. You should use a potentially go to resection. You could do a, if you're not a surgical candidate, you could do percutaneous ablation of that, and that could be potentially curative um, versus, you know, why, you know, why 90 couldn't. So, you know, you, you're in, you're kind of in a gray zone where you're, you're not, you can't really necessarily cure it. You're trying to bring it down to decrease the tumor burden or get the patient um, um, back to like transplantable criteria. All right, let's see. How often do you use a Surefire catheter? I personally have never used the Surefire catheter. However, the reps have uh, been um, to our institution. I think some of our attendings are using it uh, more. I mean, I know they through the demonstration, it does um, seem, you know, pretty, um, pretty favorable um, in terms of preventing 
re, uh, reflux of particles and, and maximizing the the full dose to the to the tumor um, because if for most for many of you maybe if you haven't seen it I encourage you to you know look at the device it basically kind of open it's a device as catheter kind of opens up almost like an umbrella so once you're injecting the particles more distally it prevents reflux and it lets the um, um, particles go to the tumor and there's kind of a complex physics involved where you're you're decreasing the uh, as it was explained to me it's kind of um decreasing the uh, forward you know constant forward pressure in, s in some way where the particles are able to reach the uh, the distal capillaries where the tumors are more easily but i'm not I w i've never used it personally but i know some of our attendings are seems pretty promising though um, maybe I miss this. I think um, I'll yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got it. Yeah, so maybe, uh, so what is the uh, maximum liver volume to safely embolize? Um, well, when we do this procedure, Let's say you had um, lesions are in the right and le left lobe of the liver. So you only can really embolize one um, lobe at a time because you need to make sure that you have hepatic reserve to prevent um, you know further liver failure. Um, in terms of you know the the more hepatic reserve, the better. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily a set volume, to my knowledge, there, there may be, but um, you know, you're you're look you're if there's a large tumor burden that you see, you're going to be looking at the liver function tests, and you're going to probably be seeing a very high bilirubin, a high melt score, which I didn't um, you know mention, or you know, so they're gonna they're gonna be you know um, poor pro prognostic indicators kind of off the off the bat there that even based on imaging you can sort of you can tell um, so sorry I don't have a definitive volume to give you but basically the principles are to just treat you know one lobe at a time um, don't be treating you know both lobes and uh, the more hepatic reserve you have the better um, so what lung shunt fraction do you use as a cutoff so typically it's 20% uh, um, um, shunting is a good um, is a good cutoff that that we use. Normal liver function at baseline. So the normal liver function at you know baseline, basically you know kind of a total belly of less than two. Um, you know an albumin you know greater than three, which demonstrates the synthetic capacity of the liver. Okay, what determines the use of servospheres and therospheres? That kind of goes back to, you know, what they originally were um, FDA approved for, but you can theoretically use them off-label. The, um, the therospheres or HCC, servospheres for um, metastatic colorectal cancer, um, they just differ in, in particle size. What is an ideal HCC tumor and when is tumor progression or say it's become a contraindication? Um, so an ideal HCC tumor, well, I, ideal for the patient would just be single and um, typically less than five centimeters because that is below the uh, Milan criteria for a transplant. If you have three lesions that are all less than three centimeters, then you're still um, favorable for transplantation. So if that patient can be trans, uh, transplanted or those tumors can be resected, they'd be potentially curative. If you exceed that, um, then, you know, you you can consider, you know, Y90 to basically bring the tuber burden down to, to potentially get to a transplant list or basically just 
uh, treated for um, survival purposes um, to increase the longevity of the patient and palliative measures. So there's, um, in terms of a contraindication, I would just say that you would have widespread um, either metastatic colorectal cancer contain, um, occupying the majority of the liver or HCC um, that has you know large tumor burden with multiple satellite lesions that you just basically in either case do not have a lot of hepatic reserve so sort of taking out a portion of the liver will put this um, for treating the lesions would put this patient in in liver failure. So this next question I think is a little bit beyond my scope. Uh, would you consider, do you have any experience combining Y90 with immune checkpoint inhibitors? I, 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 sorry, I do not have any experience with that. How do you manage your patients that end up with too much Y90 shunting to the lungs? Um, my experience, I really haven't um, had that um, happen yet. Um, you can theoretically, um, if it's not significant shunt, I think you can also decrease your dose um, because the if you have a 20% shunt, um, as long as the the total um, dose to the lungs is less than 30 gray in a single um, treatment or cumulative uh, of 50, then you can uh, potentially treat, but you have to be very cautious and you may explore other options such as TACE or um, percutaneous ablation procedures, depending on the specific tumors. Any evidence to show repeat Y90 treatment is, is uh, of benefit in the first treatment results in incomplete response. Um, I know that, you know, we do uh, repeat Y90 therapies on patients, um, but in terms of results of first treatment incomplete response, I, I, sorry, I don't really have any results for that. So, um, I know that was a lot. Hopefully I was helpful. Is there any other questions? I think that was the last one. We have uh, one more here from Matthew Hong. Oh, Matthew Hong? Any evidence to show that repeat uh, Y90 treatment is of benefit if the first oh. treatment result is uh, incomplete? Yeah, I think I was just saying that is that um, yeah, I don't really have any results that if the first treatment is is incomplete. I mean, you could theoretically try it. I mean, we 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 do we do do uh, multiple. We can do multiple treatments on patients, but in my experience, I just don't have any results where the first treatment um, basically was incomplete. Um, usually, what happens is you know there's one area we'll treat first that gets a response. And then if there's another area in the liver, we would treat that as well. But in terms of that same area being incomplete, um, I don't really have any specific results that I can share with you. And when you uh, bring them back for follow-up imaging, are you just looking for the same characteristics that you would for HCC or METS in the first place? or? Yes. Yeah, so, so ideally, um, uh, you're going to see hopefully you know you see the tumor area demonstrating no enhancement because it's, it's necrotic now um, but you know if there is any or so like if it would you would have an enhance either around the margins a arterial enhancing lesion that demonstrates washout you know or in METS um, any sort of enhancing lesion that is eccentric nodular in appearance, that's concerning for uh, recurrence and residual disease. And then so at, at that point, you know, you can consider um, retreating um, either with Y90 or if 
you want to try a different modality like percutaneous ablation, you could theoretically do that too, I guess. Great, thanks. Okay. So any other questions? I think we're done there. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. It was uh, really informative. I know I'll definitely be uh, taking a look at this webinar again. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Hopefully it was helpful. All right, everyone, have a great night. We're going to wrap it up now.